Yes, please. I have enough of a weak self-image, so you can... Um, on your table, you find one of these bingo cards, and what I want you to do is, um, as the day progresses, through all of the talks we're going to be having, um, just cross off some of these words and try and identify some of the words that you use when you're talking to people um, in what I call the, the jargon. So, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Paul Platon tōko ngoa, nō te whanganui a tāra ohu, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. My speech or my talk this morning is about how we use cybersecurity and how we misuse and abuse cybersecurity. But more than that, how things change but still remain the same. When I had to, when I was thinking about the presentation, I read a research article where this picture was used and discussed that security is much more than an IT topic. Yet as we progress, we've made it into more of a technology topic. And we only talk in terms of technology, and we think that security is the realm of technologists only. The second thing that influenced the way that I put this presentation together was, as Ashton spoke about earlier, the coronavirus. It made us work differently, but made us work the same. It presented new challenges, but there was old challenges. It's ones we haven't solved, but we had to address at that point. And the last one, the last thing that um, influenced my, my presentation was I went out for dinner with some friends of mine and we were sitting around the table and one of the friends, um, let's call him Tom for reasons of anonymity, he arrives at the table and as we're discussing, getting together and everything, he goes, oh, I'm going speed dating. And I go, we all go, cool, because he's single, he's been single for a while, and he's going speed dating. And suddenly it's a topic of interest for me because I know some people that were at that point going to go out speed dating. So I want to know what it's about, how does it work, what puts together. And as we're talking about this, another one of our friends arrived, and let's call her Joanne for sake of anonymity. And Joanna arrives, and she sits down, and we go, guess what? Tom's going speed dating. And we all have this big sigh of relief because we want to get him matched up with somebody because he's irritating when he's alone. So there he sits, and we start talking about how it's going to work, what's going to happen, and we're interested in this. And Joanna, uh, who is a, a drama student, looks at him and says, you look really nice this evening, because he normally arrives at dinner with pastel shorts, a shirt, and sailing shoes. Right? And she goes, you look nice, because he's wearing a long pants, he had a fancy shirt on. And she says, you should wear that or wear something like this to the speed dating thing. And he says, no, I'm going to stick with what I know. And she looks at him and says, well, how's that working for you? <laughs> You're still single. And he went, oh, that was very rude. <laughs> but made me think that he was expecting different results by acting the same way. And maybe he should rethink the way he's dressing to get some success. He's met someone. We're all happy. Not because of the way he dressed. But if we look at the way we have to rethink the way we do cybersecurity, we've got to go back to foundational principles. When we reflect on the way the world looks right now, our world and the World Economic Forum has put some things together about what our world looks like. And on the Cybersecurity Forum at the WEF, they've got cybersecurity professionals from all around the world. One of the things that they came up with was the fact that everybody is looking for this one thing that's going to solve all of their problems. Just a quick survey around the room. Who's been in security since the 1980s? Anybody? No, 1990s. Who's been in security from 1990? One over there. Chai do two over there. Who's been in security since the, since the 2000s? Who made their money out of Y2K? There we go. <laughs> and we're still working, even though we did that. Uh, 2010, who's been in security from 2010? 2020s? Here we go. Okay, so when we, those are the, the old ones, like Chaidu over there. Sorry, Chaidu, I know your name, so I'm going to just pick on you all the time. Um, since those days, we've been looking at the one thing that's going to solve all of our security problems. It's not a New Zealand thing. It's a global thing. And so when we look at it, there's no guarantee that even if we could find this panacea of a security solution, that it was going to solve anything. And so when we get instructions from our bosses, or if we are the bosses, we go, fix this problem now. And we go, let me find the piece of golden tech. Let me go do the research out there. 
um, I got asked by someone to discuss, uh, they wanted to know about post-quantum crypto, yeah? They go, can you please explain to me post-quantum crypto, I've got five minutes. I said, yeah, okay, not gonna happen, okay? So we can't go out there and find one golden piece of tech, but that's still what we're trying to do. If we look at it from a global perspective, there's four things that we, are being that we have to address from a global perspective. The first is the quite the obvious one. There's a resource and, a resource and knowledge gap second to none in our field. One of the reasons is because we want to recruit techies only and exclusively because only technologists can solve the security problem. One of our issues. The second thing is that we've got this issue around how do we have this increased reliance on the internet and devices and still stay secure. As human beings, we've become dumber. I have. I can't remember cell phone numbers anymore. I can't remember bank account numbers anymore. But I do know where the password manager on my phone is, and I know I can use my biometric or my face to unlock it. That's what I remember. So when we have this increased reliance on the internet and devices, it shows we've got to change the way in which we think about things. And so the minute we see that we go, hey, let's go passwordless, or let's automate the user out of it, or let's do that. The third thing is that at scale, we are up against cyber criminals, or as someone used a while back, cyber miscreants. Now we change the word again, they're criminals. And they are banding together, and they are joining forces and they are outnumbering us to get hold of us, to get hold of our data and of our clients' data. The last thing we're dealing with in our world right now is this ecosystem challenge. One solution is made up of a number of parts that are maintained and supported and built by a number of people. Apple does not own the biometric reader on your phone. It's an ecosystem thing. Apple doesn't own the TPM on your phone. You can see I'm an Apple fan, right? Um, but they do own the access to the TPM, and they won't give you access. And so having, with us sitting on a table, when we're looking at an ecosystem, we're having to manage multiple components, multiple vendors, multiple everything for one solution. That's the reality of our world right now. Another reality of our world is the fact that there's this gap. There's a skills gap. It's not imagined. It's not... A, uh, um, a fake story, it's not fake news, it is true. We have a shortage of staff and, and APAC, it's approximately 2.6 million people that we need in our industry. Now we're being told by HR professionals that if we'll, even if they increase our budget, we'll not be able to bring that skills gap down significantly. And so just that sentence, all of my technology friends goes, yep, let's automate it because they are saying we can't get enough people. There's a caveat. If we keep on recruiting just technologists and technical people and computer science majors and not the drama students, yeah, I'll have you know that Georgia over there is a drama graduate. And every day that we're in the office, we can see that she's a drama graduate. Pleasure. But there she is inside of cybersecurity. What about BCom law students? What about LLB students? What about those students that bring a different perspective to security? The second thing we are being told is that, and those of you from business, if you are guilty, then hang your head in shame. We don't bring security into discussions because we don't like the way they act. We say, they slow me down. They're going to stop this project. And then we go ahead and we develop something. And then someone says, did you pass this by security? And we go, no. And they go, now you have to. And then security goes and stops the project and go, you see, I told you. They're going to stop this project. That's what happens. That's the reality of the world that we live in right now. When we reflect on our world, that means that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Ahakoa tunui o te panone kaore e rereke atu. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And it brings about, so that guy is Jean-Baptiste Alphonse Carr, and I'm not going to say the French because I did not study French, but what it means is that you're experiencing the kind of disappointment or disillusionment or resignation that comes from the same stuff happening all the time. 
I get a new bus, but the team culture still stays the same. We get a new technology, but they're still forgetting passwords. It's that resignation about that the more things change, the more they stay the same in our world. And let's take a look at some of this history about how this has changed. We're going to talk about four challenges by talking about these four people and what these four people did. When we are rethinking cybersecurity, when we are changing cybersecurity, we need to rethink the fundamental principles that underpin what we do. The fundamental principles. We've got to look at a conceptual framework or a framework that's there that brings in the enemy that, we, that is there, not the one we thought would be there 10 years ago. If you ask anybody what a hacker looks like, it's one, pimples on his face, two, wearing a hoodie, three, sitting in a dark room, four, there's green stuff on a black screen. That's what a hacker, you describe, that's a hacker. It's not. It's my 16-year-old son sitting behind me while I'm entering my pen on my phone and then taking my phone, opening my phone and taking pictures to fill up my camera. That's what it looks like. So we've got to rethink what our enemy looks like. Ehiranga, Ranaito, Tengua. What's in a name? And here we're going to again, if anyone here is guilty of this, that's, you hang your head in shame. What's in a name? How do we call things? And when I asked who's been involved in, in security for the amount of years, you would have seen the name of security changed over the last couple of decades. Yeah. We're having discussions right now, believe it or not, about whether cybersecurity is one word or two words. Whether it's uppercase C and all lowercase C. That's the kind of discussions we're having right now. It's rubbish. It started off with being IT security, because it's information technology. Yeah, it made sense. Then it was ICT, data security, computer security. 1982, we got to blame a guy called William Gibson. We blame him. He was 34, he wrote a book, and he put the word cyber in front of there. And it was cybernetics. Yeah? And the word cyber was used to make something more interesting. Cybernetics, in terms of its entomology, comes from the Greek word kerbernetes. Who knows kerbernetes? It means a steerman, someone who's steering. That's where cyber came from. And this guy put it together, and he made things sexy. Right, like cyber law, as opposed to normal law. Or cyber insurance, as opposed to normal insurance or cyberbullying as opposed to normal bullying. Right? We put the word cyber in front of it, and suddenly our bosses and our CFOs and everybody, they decide, yes, let's give this guy money because he's using a sexy world called cyber. We've changed the way we do this. Now, what's in a name? And we'll talk about that now, because as an industry, we make up words to keep ourselves relevant and to have a job. And my friends at Gartner, I like Gartner, I dislike Gartner, I am apathetic towards Gartner, but they start this thing. So there's a new term out there. Who's heard of that? Cybersecurity mesh. So in your next budget thing, write to your CFO, I want to implement a cybersecurity mesh. And then you'll get the jargon to ensure the plasticity. Huh? What the hell is plasticity? Cyber mesh. Distributed architectural approach allows for a perimeter to be defined around the identity of a person or thing. Isn't that defense in depth? Yeah? New word. Suddenly it's sexy. You go to the boss and say, boss, defense in depth. He goes, no. I want you to put together a cybersecurity mesh. Yeah, okay. The second thing, who's heard of that abbreviation yet? Anyone? IOB, as opposed to IOT or IOD or I, I don't know what. That is called the Internet of Behaviors. Wow. And now what we're doing is we are collecting the digital dust of everybody's online transactions, and we are doing and building a profile around the digital dust, similar to what someone did one day when they got dust together and they made a human being. Digital dust. Can we talk in clearer language? I think Andrew mentioned it earlier. Can we speak more clearly what we're doing? This brings, for me, an ethical and moral challenge around the data we have and how we're using it. Let's use AI 
AI has got no morals or ethics. There's no one thing. So again, write your business plan and go to your boss and say, hey, I work in retail, I work in banking. Boss, we need to build a program around the internet of behaviors so we can gather digital dust so we can properly target our consumers. No. Hyper-automation. Who has heard of that? Tim, because Tim's talking automation. What's wrong with normal automation? Why are we hyper-automating something? And hyper-automation means, uh, and I heard this from one of my banking clients, there's always organizational debt. I still don't know what that means, because I'm stupid, okay? This debt affects the value proposition and brand, and we've got to have hyper-automation in place. Next business case around automation, go, no, no, no. No more automation, I want hyper-automation. I want to be in Star Wars right now. We use that word, my favorite, hey? Not any more normal AI, no, 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 no. Not any more normal machine learning, no. Let's create AI ops and ML ops. Let's have operational automation around machine learning. Combines it to automate processes, including event correlation, anomaly detection, and causality determination. Lovely. Eh? It wouldn't get me a date with someone, but at least I'll impress her. Then we use, and these are two normal terms in there, so let's talk about this. TX, UX, CX, and EX. So I know you would know what CX is, it's consumer experience, and the UX is obviously the user experience. The EX is what? Employee experience. Now what's the TX? Now we build this concept of the total experience. <laughs> yep, it's out there. Now as a, as a bank or as a retailer or as any organization, we're gonna go and say, boss, we're gonna implement a total user experience solution that combines user experience, customer experience, and employee experience into one seamless experience. And they're gonna go, you're the innovator of the year, I'm giving you a bonus, let's do that. My worry or concern of mine is what about all those vendors that have created everything they have around CX? All of their collateral, all of their presentations, all the solutions speaks around CX, and then I must go change control FC, control RT, change all my, my collateral. Then we have those other two words like microservices and the monolithic application. Yeah, we all use these words. But what is cybersecurity actually? What is it? Well, if we look at some of the definitions there are out there, cybersecurity consists of six things. But I've got a question. If it is cybersecurity, why do we still call the person a CISO? They're still a chief information security officer. They're not a chief cybersecurity officer, which means that there's a lot more credence in this information security. So these six things are what is traditionally formed as part of cybersecurity. So when we are developing our strategies, our plans, when we are looking at how do we put things together, those are the six areas we have to be concerned with. Application, how do we add security features to applications, not just when they're out there, but when we are developing them, when they are in their conceptual stages. Another, uh, I'm gonna use another word there, let's bake in security, hey, there we go, another one. Let's bake it in or let's plumb in security in our development framework or our software development life cycle. How about let's just talk to security about this. Let's see, talk to risk about it, and see what's there. You know all the rest of them, information security, methodology, there's network security, those are the things that are there. But that's what cybersecurity is. And so we looked at what our world looks like right now. We've established that in our world of security, IT security, information security, cybersecurity, in our world we make up words to give ourselves an existence. And we change things ever so slightly so it becomes newer and sexier. That's what we do. My kids thank you, because they've got a future. My, my daughter goes to university because we keep on making up these words. Great. Now we've got to look at what does the past look like? When we look at history, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Now the more things change, the more they stay the same. This hasn't changed. If we don't look back and see where we come from and what's affected us, we can't see what's coming. My position is that nothing's changed over the last 40 years. There's been things that have sped up. There's things that have become more complicated. 
but the fundamental is that nothing's changed over the last 40 years. We are still struggling with the same issues and the same problems, although we're using smarter words to get to it. So what has changed? Well, the time to exploit vulnerabilities has changed. We eventually got to a word called zero day, because the time just got quicker. The complexity has changed. The amount of devices we've got has changed. I check my home wireless to see which devices are on there, and there are probably 100 times more devices on there than I have people inside that house. Because every child that walks in with my son goes, Dad, can I get the wireless password? I'm like, yeah, okay. And then they're not friends anymore, but they still got my wireless password. I'm surprised I don't have kids parked out in the driveway stealing my Wi-Fi. The disappearance of the network boundary. We went from the network boundaries in the wall where the plug is. Now it's at the airport where you're on your VPN. No, it's at your mobile phone now. No, it's at your identity. Or no, it's now at the data layer. That's changed. The need for agility and speed hasn't changed. I remember just starting off in the industry, and there was a virus attack. And what did I do? I ran to the server, and I pulled the cable out. Here we go. Problem solved. The virus can't get in. Now the need for speed has changed because things are happening so rapidly. Because these people are collectively getting together and going, hey, let's do a nation state on somebody. Let's hit a stock exchange. Let's do something. Okay? Competing priorities haven't changed. I could never battle to get budget for an AV product. But I battle to get money for something else. Because it's always competing products. If you're in the banking world, then the digital experience team that are customer facing get the most money. Because right? we've got to make the customer happy. But this at the back that's trying to sort out how the customer can securely transact with me? No, no. Smell of an oily rag or two cents in the corner. If we think about it, you know, nothing, and I said nothing's changed. So worms, in terms of malicious code, not new. 1971, the creeper worm. Went and did horrible stuff. Ransomware, new? No. 1989, the first one was called the AIDS Trojan. AIDS as in the disease and was distributed by a floppy disk sent through the post before we knew what we were doing. Stuck the floppy disk in, and there's no young ones here. The floppy disk looks like the big safe icon. That's what a floppy disk is. Stuck in a floppy disk, and it encrypted the, uh, the hard drive. First ransomware attack was in 1989. Have we managed to solve that problem yet? No. Then, in the 5th of May 2000, was the I love you virus. And everyone loves to be told I love you. And so they sent out a mail, and the subject line was, I love you. And there was an attachment that said, I love you. And you opened up, and you weren't loved anymore. <laughs> so these things that we've been having since 1989 or 1971, we are still grappling with it. So what hasn't changed? The time to exploit vulnerabilities. It has not changed. All of the things that we were battling with in the past hasn't changed. Yes, there's been speed and velocity and the intensity and the value of the payload. That's increased, but not the fundamental cause. And so if they get, if they, no one knows from Target, if they hit a Target database, they get it. I once did some work with a, um, a milk farmer. I don't know if that's the right word, but milk, not a milk producer, he's a farmer. He's got cows and they've got milk. And I went to him, and one of the sales guys went in and said, and tried to sell him security. And he was like, I'll get away. And they said, Paul, can you come in and talk to this guy? Because he needs a firewall. He needs, at that time, it was the, the old way of doing identity-based encryption with mail and all sorts of stuff. And I went in there, and I said to the guy, so what do you do? And he went, no, 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 no. And I went, let's go. Who cares? He does milk. He's cows. Give milk. No one's going to hack a cow. It's different. He supplies milk to the same people. They all know what his milk costs. There's nothing there. Now we go to something else, and they go, everything, the data is all inside of there. So we've got to change that. I call this the CISO's prayer. Anyone who's been in IT and had to work for someone, we the willing, that's us, led by the unknowing, that's our bosses, and doing the impossible for the ungrateful, that's the company, we have done so much with so little for so long that we are now qualified to do anything with nothing. Isn't that how we feel? Don't give this to your boss, you may get fired. <laughs> this is something we've had to do with all our life, all our careers. Stakeholder apathy, has that changed? No. Decreasing budgets, 
competing priorities. That hasn't changed. Even though we tell them there's an increase of velocity in attacks, of vulnerabilities, of impact of this, they go, no, I'm going to give money to the people that are designing the mobile app rather than your security. That's the way it happens. What are we going to do? If we, the willing, are there, how do we change this? And I mentioned this to someone earlier. Do we um, create our own cyber attacks inside our company? Do we take down the network so that they can know that I'm right? And I need that automation from hyperness, and I need to gather digital dust to prove my point. We can't do that. So just for the record, everyone hearing me, the recording, don't do it. Do not create your own things. We need to change the way we speak. That's important. Try to sell security to a guy who owned a chicken farm. All these animal analogies now. But anyway, he sat down and he said to me, Paul, how is what you asking me to do, which is digitization of their records, going to get me more chickens. Something we face all the time. How is this hyper-automation internet of behavior going to get me more clients, more money, more investment? Okay? We've got to answer those kind of questions. Avoiding jargon is some of the things you have to do. So just if we talk about cybersecurity mission, I'm going to read it out. A model that retains the plasticity in your mind, sit in front of your CIO or your CFO, sit in front of them right now and go, boss, we need to do this cybersecurity mesh because it's going to retain the plasticity. If that were you, what would you say and do? Avoid the jargon. So what do we do? One is we have to translate the technology limitations. Translate technology limitations. It can't do everything into business speak and translate the business requirements into tech speak. That's an important way of getting across, keeping it simple. The second thing that we do is that we communicate the why in terms of the risk and the impact. If we don't do this, then that is going to happen and will have an impact on our bottom line, like I want to do self-service on my password, uh, password changes. No. Well, if we don't, Here's the things we can do. Here's the money we can save. Here's the investment we can put together. Communicating in terms of the risk and the impact. That will get us what we need to do. The next one is show the value. How many of us go back and actually show them the pretty pictures? The red and the orange and the green. And my colleague Gavin will talk about that later on. You go there and you go, here's all the red that it started off at. I've now decreased the red bubble. We've got less orange bubble and our green bubble is bigger because that's all they can handle. The board can't handle words. They can handle pictures. And say, this is how it's worked. This is how your investment's paid off. Do we ever go back and tell them how it's paid off? No, we go back and ask for more money for something else. And so when we talk, we talk in terms of why, and we talk in terms of how we've improved, and then we avoid the jargon. We call it what it is, not internet of behaviors. We don't talk about that. We talk about what the problem actually is. And finally... This guy's name is Rahm Emanuel, and he became famous Chicago mayor, New York mayor, but he worked with Barack Obama on his very first election campaign. Um, they're actually terrified of this guy. He was, he's that kind of guy. But what is important about what he said is that. When we rethink cybersecurity, when we rethink security, when we rethink the way that we fundamentally do things, the fundamental principles of what we do, we are able to do things that we didn't think we could do before. What are those kind of things? Well, I was fortunate one year to be sent on a leadership course, and one of the things they gave us at this course was this book. And I became extremely excited because it said the one thing you need to know. And me, lazy, I wanted the one thing. Seven chapters, 289 pages later, I discovered that the one thing was a combination of seven things. Disappointment all over my face. Because I paid for that course, so I paid for the book, I could have bought something else. But the one thing that we needed to know about leading and managing teams was seven chapters and 289 pages long. There's no one thing that we need to know or do as cybersecurity professionals. There's not a one thing. Get that out of your mind. When we're rethinking the way we approach security and the enterprise and inclusive way we do it, there's not a one thing anymore. What's the opportunity for us? One, recruit differently. 
please recruit differently. Please do not depend on just recruiting technology people. Please recruit other students. You can teach skill. You can't teach attitude. And when these kids are coming out of the young people, sorry, not kids, come out of university, let's give them credit for the skills they've had to learn. If they were a receptionist somewhere, what skills have they got? Conflict management, because someone always shouts at the receptionist. Managing priorities, because they must use the phone and type at the same time. Isn't that the kind of people we want in cybersecurity? That's the kind of people we want. Not the guy who's got a peaker eye stood up in his lounge because he's managing his lawnmower. He's one of them, but we recruit differently. The second thing we do is we communicate differently. We talk differently. We use plain language. We explain the problem in terms of risk and impact. We talk about why this is so important. We ask for money differently. My son has learned. When he wants money now, he doesn't say, Dad, I want money because I want to get some food. He goes, Dad, I'm taking my girlfriend out. Can I have money so that I can buy her food? He knows I like her. So I can't let her go hungry, so then I give him food. He asks for his investment differently. we got to ask differently for the money that we want. And we've got to make good use of the money. The fourth thing we've got to do, please resist knee-jerk reactions to problems. There was a distributed denial of service attack that happened a couple of months ago. What was the first reaction? You must implement web application firewalls. That was the first knee-jerk reaction. There was no looking at the incident response and going, hold on, what else was there? No, implement WAF, and they'll never come in again once we have WAF in. We know that's nonsense. So silver bullet thinking is gone. Don't do that anymore. Don't have knee-jerk reactions to things. When the CEO calls and goes, what can we do about this? He goes, let's do this one thing. Let's actively encourage the breaking down of silos. You want to know how to respond to an incident CEO? We'll call in our risk people, our networking people, our developers, our security guys, and we'll all sit together and we'll solve this problem collectively. Build an enterprise environment and without just technical controls. The next tech is not going to do it. All of it. So I'm not saying that automation's bad. I'm not saying that um, seams are bad. I'm not saying that saws are bad. I'm not saying any of those things, all the abbreviations I just used are bad. They're good and they serve a purpose. But if they don't understand what the purpose is, then they are ineffective. So we need to bring about that enterprise thinking across everything that we do. Don't be afraid to bring in the security guy or the risk guy so the impact and the risk can be discussed. The networking guy so his experience around firewalls can be brought in and the security guy so he can go, that'll make sense, let's do that. He pai te tiranga kina Mahara mona ra pahemo engari kaputa te maramatanga irunga ite titiro fakamua. It is fine to have recollections of the past, but wisdom comes from being able to prepare opportunities for the future. And that's our job as cybersecurity professionals. Thank you very much.